Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share a few thoughts about the Sunjata. Now you may never have heard of this work before, but it's a West African epic and it's absolutely incredible. Fans of the Icelandic sagas, of the Irish Thon, of you know, heroic or frankly unheroic epic will probably really find much to enjoy and appreciate in these works. It is based on the historical Sunjata who founded the Mali Empire in West Africa in the 13th century. And then these stories, these tales, these songs were preserved in the oral tradition for about 750 years. In the 1970s, Gordon Hines went to the Gambia and recorded two different singers who were performing to live to very different audiences and translated their versions of this epic. Uh, I want to focus on the first one from Bamba Suso, uh, in part because it's a little bit shorter. It serves as a great introduction to this fantastic work of world literature uh, because his audience was uh, school uh, classroom of school children. And so he tailors the, the performance to that audience. And here's how he starts. It is I, Bamba Suso, who am talking, along with Amadou Jibate. It is Amadou Jibate who is playing the kora, which is this big liar harp. Uh, and it is I, Bamba Suso, who am doing the talking. Our home is at Sotuma. That is where we both were born. This tune that I am now playing, I learned it from my father, and he learned it from my grandfather. And he goes on to brag about how his grandfather was one of the first people to have one of these large harps. Uh, and he goes on to, to talk about his, his you know, heritage, his musician's heritage. And before he continues, he goes, all right. I'm going to tell you the story of Sunjata, and you must pay attention. And we do have to, because even though Bamba Suso is singing to an audience of school children, he uh, has certain assumptions that he is able to make about his audience. He's singing their national epic. This is a national epic, not just in the Gambia, but in Mali, in Guinea-Bissau, in Guinea. Uh, this is a, a critical story that, that has deeply influenced uh, culture and heritage and history there. So as he sings, he's aware that they, they know certain things. And the Sunjata that we're introduced to is a fascinating character uh, from his conception, from his birth, uh, from his, his childhood. He does not necessarily seem heroic. He seems to have uh, the, these barriers, these obstacles he has to overcome that are interesting, even, uh, even in this short, concise account. The king had declared, Fatakum Makang had declared, if any of my wives gives birth to a son, I shall give my kingship to him. Sukulun Conte eventually gave birth to Sunjata's mother. They sent a slave with the instructions, go and tell Sunjata's father. At that time, he had built a camp, camp compound out on the farmland. When the slave came, he found them eating, and they said to him, all right, sit down, have something to eat. The slave sat down. It was not long before a co-wife of Sukulung's also gave birth. When her co-wife gave birth, they sent a griot. When the griot arrived, he said, greetings. They said to him, come and have something to eat before you say anything. He said, no. The Greit said, Nareng Daniang Konate, your wife has given birth a, a boy. The slave was sitting. He said, they sent me first. It was Sukulun Konte who gave birth first. Fatakung Makang declared, the one I heard of first? He it is who is my son, the firstborn. That made Sunjata angry. For seven years, he crawled on all fours and refused to get up. And so we are right away introduced to these barriers around uh, uh, to Sunjata and how he is the firstborn, but he's not recognized as the, as the firstborn. And in some ways that um, affects the idea that he is ultimately going to lead this large sort of Mande uh, rebellion and restore uh, his lands and, and the rule of his lands and, and his villages and his people to one of their own rather than someone from a different part of Africa. And, and so that, 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 um, emphasis on how he is already confronting this idea of what should be his is not given to him, is not sort of laid out for him right away, uh, even at his birth. And so for seven years, we, we have this boy who's, he crawls around, he, he won't behave the way the other boys do, and no one will get him up until uh, <laughs> they even try to put some rods, iron rods together, and they try to lift him to take him into the hut with the other boys uh, for his, his ritual circumcision, and he the rods break. So they go and get his mother. When a child has fallen down, it is his mother who picks him up. When his mother came, he laid his hand upon his mother's shoulder, and he arose and stood up. It is from that incident that the Gryats say, the lion has arisen. They say, the lion of Manding has arisen. The mighty one has arisen. And he go, they go on to share other stories about his life and his early childhood and how he uh, is a striver. But there are these ways in which he very much has to rely on others to help him get through these barriers, whether they're self-imposed barriers or whether they're external barriers. And that idea of community and, and, and response, social responsibility among the group is really interesting and fascinating in comparison to a lot of epics where it's just one hero who's overpowering everybody else and, and sort of has control. It reveals a very different side of a culture 
uh, that that Sunjata, as much as he will become this uh, epic hero throughout the the story and the poem, uh, does have a need for assistance from others at many different junctures. In one, he has an argument with another uh, one who who says sort of like you know, you're not even recognized as the firstborn. You're probably not even legitimate. And and so they have this contest, and Sunjata thinks that he is able to say certain things, but his mom clarifies something. She says. You went too far in your boast. For seven years, I was pregnant with you, and I never had a fright. But during the rainy season, it was thundering. And when your father called me, I did not hear him. And he called me a second time. That day, I went in trepidation to your father. Go and take that out of your boast and then see what happens. When he had removed that declaration from his boast, he shot the silk cotton tree, and the tree leant over and was about to fall. Tamaga Janding Keo was standing nearby. He shouted at the silk cotton tree, and the tree was about to rise up straight again. Then Sunjata bellowed at the tree, and it split down the middle and fell to the ground. Even to this day, when a silk cotton tree is drying up, it begins at the top. It never dries up at the foot. It begins at the top. And this, you know, fight begins. Uh, and then Sujata is reminded of a prophecy that he needs to have some control over his anger, that he cannot simply just annihilate everyone around him who infuriates him. He has to have control to a certain point uh, for the, the, these, you know, the, this destiny that he's supposed to have to be fulfilled. And so that, again, is this interesting thing. Rather than um, Allah Samson in the Hebrew Bible giving vent to his rage and just destroying everything around him, we have a character who is heroic, who, who is not given all of the, the gifts and, and the, the kingship that he feels is his right, but rather has to find self-control, has to learn self-discipline, and is, again, reminded of it by others rather than just reminding himself of it. And so that community continues to persist. And so towards the end of this poem, uh, Sunjata is now rallying his army and they're, they're besieging a city and they can't find success. And so his sister offers to go in essentially as a spy and she will seduce someone and, and, and find out what is it that, you know, allows, what, what is this power that is preventing the success of Sunjata's army? So she's talking. Uh, these events were taking place. Dabi was still alive. When Sumanguru said to Sunjata's sister, my father is a jinn, the secret is out. The old lady appeared and she said to him, don't give away all your secrets to a one night woman. When Susu Sumanguru's mother said that, the woman got up and said to him, I'm going because your mother is driving me away. He said, wait. He went and gave his mother some palm wine and she drank it, became drunk and fell asleep. He said to Sunjata's sister, let us continue with our chat. She is an old lady. They were chatting and she said to him, did you say that your father is a jinn? He said, my father is a jinn and he lives on this hill. This jinn has seven heads. So long as he is alive, war will never damage this country. She said to him, your father, how can he be killed? He said, you must go and find a white chicken. Then they must remove the spur of the white chicken. They must pick the leaves of self-seeded guinea corn. They must put corte powder in it. If they put that on the tip of an arrow and shoot it at this hill, they will kill my father. That is the only thing that will kill him. She asked him, supposing they kill him. He replied, if war came, this country would be destroyed. She asked, supposing this land were destroyed, what would happen to you? He said, I would become a whirlwind. She said, supposing people went into the whirlwind with swords. He said, I would become an African fan palm. She said to him, what if people were about to fell the palm? He said, I would become an anthill. She asked, suppose people were about to scatter the anthill. He said, I would become a Senegalese coup. His heart palpitated and he fell silent. The woman said to him, wait, I am going to the wash place. Because a woman and a man do not go to bed together dirty. And there's this aside now where the harpist jumps in and sort of finishes, you know, almost this hint to the audience of children, finishes what, what that character was about to reveal and what everybody knows. Uh, and then I won't, I won't read the, the final like climactic battle, but it's quite interesting to see how that, you know, ex explanation of what will happen if, you know, here's how to kill the djinn. And now the, 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 protection around this city is gone. And so here's what I will do as the leader. Uh, and, and how does that transpire? How does it unfold? Well, read this for yourself and find out because it really is good. It's really, uh, it's short, but it's very energetic. It's very enjoyable. Now, the other version from uh, Bana Kanut, I will probably share that in April. That one is very different. As I said, it's for a different audience. Uh, it's, it's about twice as long. And it, it is much more, even, even more active and um, vital and urgent and, and robust as a work. But, but this is a great introduction, so I would really encourage you to read it. There is a prose version, if you're interested, uh, that was sort of compiled by D.T. Uh, Nian, who was a uh, scholar from Guinea, 
who got together a whole group of different singers and had each of them perform and sort of picked out the common points and wove together this um, sort of prose redaction in the sense of the Sunjata. And I believe that's published by Longman. Um, but I really like these two versions quite a bit, um, the, the translations from Gordon Ein. So these are quite good. As I had mentioned, it's very close to uh, some of the ideas in the, the Irish Thon, um, particularly the idea of etiologies, the idea that we're going to find out why something happens a certain way. We're going to get an accounting for why a place is named something, or in the Sunjata, why are there two families that are always uh, linked together? One of Sunjata's greatest allies, uh, they, they say to this day their families are linked together. They can't lie to each other. They can't deceive each other. You know, they, 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 they must treat each other well if they don't awful things happen to them. And so uh, the, the, that element, and along, of course, the heroic element, is really interesting um, to compare across different cultures. One of the things that's great about the Sunjata is that it is a sort of modern extant oral tradition. Even during the 20th century, versions were changing. It was being adapted, and in the 20th century, of course, being adapted into new media as a living oral tradition. Uh, contemporaneous with the historical Sunjata, we have the creation and, and redaction from oral tradition of the Icelandic sagas, works like the sagas of the Volsungs. And uh, I would say the other one that certainly I was reminded of was Egil's saga, in part because of the way that Sunjata is, doesn't always seem heroic as a boy and as he's growing up, and yet gradually finds that self-discipline and, and, and becomes uh, heroic in a very interesting way that is also very um, just and noble. Uh, and so I was thinking of the sagas of the Icelanders. It's almost impossible to mention epic without mentioning a work like the Iliad by Homer. It's certainly, the Sunjata is not the length of the Iliad, um, it, uh, and yet it has great scenes of power and really interesting etiologies uh, across it. And, and I think the, the cultural contrast is very different as well. The, the way that we see the, the role of the community within the Sunjata. Um, another work that, that is, uh, you know, from from Asia and well, Western Asia would be the uh, Shaname by Abu Qasim Ferdowsi. And you could almost pick one of the chapters in here, one of the chapters from uh, Rostam or, or one of the other heroes. And I think you would find that, that very comparable to uh, the, the, you know, the focused nature of the Sunjata. Another work that I was reminded of would be the Book of Deed Korkut, uh, which is um, a series of, of sort of tales of uh, Turkish uh, heroes. And then, um, as I had mentioned, the Sunjata is, is this is a national story for Mali, for uh, Guinea, um, not just the Gambia. And so the Radiance of the King by Kamar Ale feels very relevant. And particularly in the way that, that this, again, acts as a, a, an inversion and reversion of many of the ideas that we, we think of as so um, primary in the European uh, traditions of the novel or of the epic. And to see that how um, African writers and African singers have and African poets have, have adapted um, these forms to their own stories is really quite interesting. So I hope everybody's doing well. Thanks.